Um, I know it when I see it. That's one way of thinking about it, because creativity is often easy to recognize and hard to define. And if you see that quote that Matt has, Justice Potter Stewart, was actually how Justice Stewart defined pornography in the Supreme Court decision. That I know it when I see it, and creativity in some ways is like that. But it seems to us that we ought to do better. So I'm going to share with you some examples of creativity. Example one is it's a fantastic social innovation, um, which I think is going to have a huge educational payoff in the future. And this is Muhammad Yunus, Nobel Prize Prize winner two years ago, and the inventor of the idea of the microcredit. I don't know how many of you know about the microcredit. These are small loans that are given to people in villages, typically $15, $20. The return rate on these investments is much better than loans that typically banks have been giving. And these people use these to set up their own little shop or some kind of a store or something like that. And here's a woman who has received that loan, and you can see the kids behind her. So this is a huge change in the way we think about it, about development in in the third world. Interesting thing here is that they found out that it's much smarter to give loans to women than to men. Men tend to drink it up and waste it while women end up supporting the family, which is why I think that a, support, you know, a family that's supported and nurtured, kids go to school. So in some way, this is a huge educational uh, move. It's grown a great deal. It's grown from around 8 million to over 100 million people across many countries in the world today a good example of a creative solution. Second example, this is a personal one. This is getting my son to be interested in reading. Um, you know, he's a very sporty kind of guy and stuff like that. And so we'd buy him books and we'd buy him software. And he would do that. And don't get me wrong. It's not that he wouldn't do what we asked him to. But he wouldn't go out and seek it out. He didn't want to read. So I gambled $20 a year for the past three years um, by putting him into an NCAA bracket pool run by Matt here. And um, one can argue that, <clears throat> that that's possibly a bad idea. But the result that we are seeing here is that over the past three years, I've seen an increased sophistication and knowledge and understanding of sports, his interest in going and reading the newspaper every day, and he has never made me back any money. I'm hoping this year would be um, the year that I get my repaid on my investment. But what is most interesting is that every morning, he's the first guy out the door getting the newspaper and reading the newspaper. And that's something I think that is invaluable. And that's great, particularly when you're in Michigan and the weather we've been getting, it's him getting out in the snow and getting the newspaper. <laughs> so that's really important. So that's example two. Example three. This is an example I found in a men's room um, somewhere, and this is in Shifal Airport. So I'm, you know, laid over there because I'm traveling to India or something, and I go to the men's room and I go to the toilet, and I find there's a bug. I'm like, ooh, this is not good. So I go to the next one, and I f figure out that, oh, it's not a bug, it's actually a feature. <laughs> so I took some photographs there, and that's actually, I'll give you a close up, that's actually. Um, a printed bug. <laughs> so, um, it's a pretty accurately rendered um, printed 3D bug that's printed on the toilet bowl. Turn out, turns out it's a great design feature since uh, men, and I'm not suggesting anything here, um, tend to lead to less spills and a cleaner and um, easier to maintain public restrooms. I've got something to do with our evolutionary past. I don't know. Uh, I don't want to go there. I haven't, I haven't been to the women's room to check it out so to know what's going on there. I think I was in enough trouble, as Matt is suggesting here, post 9-11 with a digital camera in an airport. Uh, but those are the kinds of sacrifices we make for research. All right, so three examples. What's common to all these examples? So here's creativity one, two, three. First, a creative idea is new. It's novel, it's different, it's innovative, it's astonishing, it's surprising, all these kinds of good words. But that's clearly not enough, as this middle fork over there shows that just being unique doesn't mean you're useful. So clearly creativity, when we talk about it, needs to have a component of being effective, 
of being useful, valuable, important, significant, so on and so forth. And look at the three examples that we talked about. Each of those was something novel, but it also was useful. It solved the problem in a different and a new kind of way. But that's not all. Most definitions of creativity, in fact, if you look up, will stick themselves to these two. But we feel that there is one absolutely integral thing that was missing in most of these definitions, that the creative solution is whole in some way. It's integrated. There's an aesthetic integration, a completeness, a beauty, an elegance to a creative solution which makes it really powerful. And when you think about wicked problems, you cannot break them down into little parts and solve each part. There has to be a holistic component to that, and I think the creative solution captures that. So we say it's not just new, but it's the new new. And what do we mean by that? We mean it needs to be novel, effective, and whole. Novel, effective, and whole. That's a nice little acronym. Ah, Matt sent me a message again. And he says, well, creativity is about this big aha moment. You know, special people are creative, Picassos and the Einsteins of the world. But I think a lot of research shows that he is wrong. <laughs> that really, creativity is nothing but variations on a theme. That you take an idea and you tweak it. And you tweak it and you tweak it and then you end up with something very new. Um, let's look at an example of the Rubik Cube. All right? Let's do some, and I've done this in workshops where we have students actually come up with variations. So I'll not do that today for uh, things of time. But here are some superficial variations that one can do. For instance, you can change the stickers from being square to circular. You can make a keychain out of it. You can put jewels on it. Um, you can actually make it for Braille so that blind people can solve it. And my favorite, which is the all red Ruby cube. Um, took me not much time to figure that one out. So um, I thought that was good. But here's another variation that one can make. Why is it three by three by three? So some people made these. Two by two by two, four by four by four, five by five by five, right? Then somebody asked the question, why this repeating three by three by three? Why n by n by n? So they came up with these ones. It's a two by three by two, and so on and variations so forth. So you can see, and if you go to twistypuzzles.com, you can get over a thousand variations. You know, so I just picked up, uh, we just picked up a few from there. Now, the ruby cube is a cube, which is a platonic solid. So somebody asked the question, hmm, can we make it out of other shapes which are platonic solids? So there we go. You have your dodecahedron and your icosahedrons and your tetrahedrons, all of which have been made into puzzles. <coughs> then somebody went and asked the question, why restrict ourselves to three dimensions? And so they made a software hypercube. It's a Rubik's Cube in four dimensions. I do not recommend that you play it. <laughs> you know, um, I tried, it took me, I think, 15 minutes just to figure out how I could make a move. <laughs> um, so I don't really strongly recommend that. But one thing about all these examples, I think all of you would be thinking that these seems like obvious moves in this problem space. You know, you take one from two by two, two, you go to three by three by three. Now I want to share an example with you um, of game designer, puzzle designer Scott Kim, where he looked at one aspect which he calls simultaneous motion, which is that when you twist the Rubik's Cube, certain pieces which are behind come up to the front and pieces that are in the front go you know, back, which means you have to keep thinking what's happening back there. So he said, what would a game look like if I just get the idea of simultaneous motion and remove everything else? And so he came up with this game called Double Maze. And what happens in this that you have to get those two white balls to specific locations within each maze. The problem is, when you make a move on this ball, the other ball moves at the same time. So which means, again, if you look at this game, would you see a connection to a Rubik's Cube? It is a completely different thing, but what he did is that he took one element of that and tweaked that and pushed it to its limit. So in that sense, creativity is nothing but tweaking knobs the idea being that you have the right knobs to tweak. So, you with me, Matt? <laughs> <laughs>